Good evening, one and all. I'm Myrna Dawson, President-elect of the Canadian Sociological Association. I am thrilled to be chair of the opening ceremony for the 19th International Sociological Association World Congress of Sociology. We are thrilled you have joined us this evening for our set of activities, which are a finely tuned set of activities, so I will introduce the first um, portion of the program. To begin the evening, it is my pleasure to introduce the Red Urban Project to welcome you to Turtle Island. The Red Urban Project was created to teach about First Nations culture and to be a hub for Indigenous performers. The project is located in Montreal, Quebec, and was founded by Alan Harrington, Ojibwe, Shoal Lake, 39 First Nation, Ontario. Group performers, First Nations dancers, are from Quebec and Ontario and represent many Indigenous nations from across Turtle Island, known today as North America. The diversity of dancers also pays tribute to the diversity of Toronto's urban Indigenous community. Drum group and singers, Young Ogichida is a grum, drum group from the heart of Toronto. The drum group carrier is Cody D. Sakuraya. The word Ogichida is Ojibwe or Anishinaabe and means warrior. This welcome to Turtle Island is derived from grand entries that typically take place at powwows. They involve a profession of dancers serving as bringing together of nations. The audience is expected to stand during this time. The songs express respect in a ceremonial way.
Thank you. To open the World Congress of Sociology, we wish to acknowledge that we are on the territory of Dish With One, S One Spoon Wampum Treaty. This is an agreement between the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee to peaceably share and protect the land. This includes the traditional lands of Huron Wendat, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee, and the treaty lands of Mississaugas, of the Credit in the Great Lakes region. We do so with respect for the indigenous peoples who have been living here for thousands of years and to acknowledge that their presence is ongoing. We do so as well to recognize our colonial history and work toward reconciliation. We are grateful to have the opportunity to meet on this land and to take time to attend sessions that will better inform us about the experiences and collective action of local and international indigenous peoples. It is the hope that together, everyone will be mindful to look for ways to use our interactions to enhance the discipline of sociology as well as exchange knowledges with indigenous and other communities at World Congress and beyond. Thank you. I would like to also now introduce Amy Desjarlais, who is a knowledge keeper for the Beaver Clan, Clan Wasakasing First Nation, Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Anishinaabe. I did my best. Ani, Tanse, Wache, Sego, Nit, Kwe, Segoli, Oka, Oki, Nihao, Salamat, Asalam Alaikum, Ohio, Konichiwa, Neho, Ola, Guten Tag, Ciao, Strazutie, Anyong Haseo, Merhaba, Sanbanu, Jambo, Habari, Namaste, Bonjour, and Hello. If you did not hear your greeting in the way of our Ogichita family, I bring you to my heart, and all is well with us. When a bojo Wabishka Gagagi, Jaushko Shkishko Kwedish Nekar, Wasaksing and Donjba, Ojibwe, Bodewadimi, Anishinaabe, and Dao. It is so beautiful to be here, and I am so proud to be in Anishinaabe today. <laughs> My heart was filled with joy to see our people walk in here, dance in here in our traditional regalia and show ourselves as we are meant to be proud and in our beautiful, beautiful uh, way of life. It's such an honor to be here to welcome all of you from all over the world um, to be in these, in these lands of Turtle Island to welcome you to these lands and to this territory, the dish with one spoon. I was offered a sema, our sacred medicine, our prayer medicine, uh, to open and offer blessings in a really good way. And so I'd like to offer some words um, in, uh, in my language, Ojibwe. Um, I didn't grow up with them, so if it's uh, to any speakers, I apologize that are in the room. Uh, if it's pronounced pronounced wrong, I I um, humbly uh, I offer these words with great humility. When a bojo, kuchimi gwech kishemenado, hena ge go gi mi shiang minwa guding gi gishgat, gizes gi benabid, kuchimi gwech gi mi shiang eusa bamadzeng, wido kushna jenomeyang guayak jibamoseyang mi gwech mi gwech mi gwech. And so in our language, I offer some greetings and gratitude and thanks to our great kind mystery, Gajemanado. We offer thanks and gratitude for all that we have been given. 
Like the dish with one spoon, we are not here without help. We are here because of the land, our mother, the earth. And we've heard that heartbeat that our drum represents, that first heartbeat, um, that mother earth's heartbeat. And so we give so much greetings and gratitude and thanks to our mother who continues to provide for us. That's what that dish is in this territory is that sustenance, all of the plants, all of the food, all of the animals, all of the medicines that, um, that are residing in this world, all of those spirits continue to do what great kind mystery had asked of them. And that is to help us humans live in our, in our good life here in, this, in these lands. And we are to respect those spirits for the things that they sacrifice for us every day so that we can survive. And so we give our thanks to them continuously for doing as Great Kind Mystery has asked them to help us, human beings, the ones that came after those first family, those animals and the plants and the medicines. We came after them and they had to help us because we are, we are poor and, and pitiful. We don't have the talents. We don't have the furs that our family have. And so they helped us. And so we give those greetings and we give those thanks to them every day. And we made that commitment to make sure that those beings continue to survive because without them, we would not be here. And so that dish is represented um, in those, those, those animals. And the, and the resources and the lands and, the, and all of those things that, that reside in these, in these places. And that spoon is, is talking about we're going to share those resources. We're going to share and all of the gifts that those beings give to us in a good way. That spoon represents that we are not going to fight over. We're not going to fight over the dish. We are all coming to the dish and we're going to share in a peaceful way. And so I would like to um, say Gachimi Gwech, those words are saying that we are coming with gratitude, that we are asking for help to live a good life. We are asking to help for help to pray because sometimes we forget that we're not alone. We sometimes we feel like that. And we are saying and greeting those um, beings in the sky world, the sun who gives us m all of life, um, the, the blessings that he brings all, all the time, he's come up again. And so we offer our, our thanks for that. And we thank especially the water, for without water, we would not be here as well. So I'd like to say Gachimi Gwech for uh, inviting me here. And, uh, and I hope you have a wonderful stay. Gachimi Gwech. So our guys are going to file back out. Miigwech. So as I began, I said that we're very happy to have you all with us this evening to kick off the World Congress of Sociology. And to begin to demonstrate that, we have three welcome addresses from individuals that I'm sure are familiar to, very, to many of you. Beginning with Margaret Abraham, President of the International Sociological Association, followed by Patricia Albinese, Chair of the Local Organizing Committee, and last but not least, by Rima Wilkes, who is President of the Canadian Sociological Association. We'll begin with Margaret. I'm a little short. 
What a warm welcome to Turtle Island. Many thanks to the Red Urban Project and young Ogichida. Thank you so much to Amy Desarale. Thank you, Myrna, for the important land acknowledgement recognizing that we are holding this Congress on indigenous territory. Starting the opening ceremony in this way, it provides us with context. It reminds us of past histories and connects us to the present moment. It also brings together, it also brings us together to start off this 19th Congress in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. Distinguished guests, colleagues, and friends, on behalf of the International Sociological Association, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the 19th International Sociological Association's World Congress of Sociology. The theme for this year is power, violence, and justice, reflections, responses, and responsibilities. This offers us an important platform for dialogue and debate around these key concerns that impact our lives in multiple ways. From across the world, we come together to consider the complexities of power, violence, and justice in our time. To this end, we will address issues that influence social structures, social relations, and social behavior. It will involve interrogating power and the powerful, critiquing colonial histories and contemporary land appropriations, reflecting on the structures and cultural processes that perpetuate violence against indigenous peoples and minorities, revisiting patriarchy, and the continuing violence and discrimination against women, studying the violence of wars, poverty, racism, gender and intersectional violence, and all forms of dispossession. This international conference also helps us to develop a contextual global public sociology that addresses these contentious issues of our time with the ultimate purpose of creating a more just world. The sociologist's understanding of the world is incomplete without the perspectives of other disciplines. An important aspect of this conference is to provide the potential for synergy and a better comprehension of issues that we hope to achieve through our sustained interactions with each other and the world at large. Together, we hope to deepen our insights and find effective ways of countering the forces perpetuating violence and subverting equality and justice. A tremendous amount of work has been undertaken backstage to ensure the success of this 19th ISA World Congress of Sociology with more than 5,000 participants from 101 countries. We have over 1,200 sessions, as well as three spotlight, important spotlight sessions. We are fortunate to have a strong program due to the immense efforts of the research committees, working groups, national and regional associations. In particular, I, Dr. Patricia Albanese, local organizing committee's chair, has played a pivotal leadership role, and together with the local organizing committee, the Canadian Sociological Association, and its coordinator, Sherry Fox, in, in preparations here in Toronto. Thank you to our volunteers today. The ISA prog program committee has played an important role in the development of the Congress program, and the ISA executive committee has also been an integral part of this journey. The Congress owes much to the incredible dedication, organizational experience, and careful coordination at all stages 
by ISA Executive Secretary Dr. Isabella Barlinska and the ISA Secretariat team. To each of you Congress participants, this 19th World Congress of Sociology is an opportunity to show that sociology matters, that together with scholars, public intellectuals, policymakers, journalists, activists from diverse fields and communities, we can all contribute and offer pathways to a more just world. May you also find time for fun and time to engage with different communities and build friendships along the way. Once again, a very, very warm welcome to you all. Thank you. Good evening. I vividly, vividly recall a clear, warm spring morning in Beirut, Lebanon in 2012. Then CSA President James Frideris, a representative of the Metro Toronto Convention Center, and I as CSA Secretary nervously and speedily walked across the incredibly beautiful seaside campus of the American University of Beirut. We were there to give our pitch to host the 2018 ISA World Congress, uh, to the executive sitting at attentively in a university boardroom. The bid felt like a long shot and the year 2018 felt very, very far off. But here we are together in 2018 at the ISA World Congress and in Toronto. I couldn't be more proud, more honored, or more delighted to welcome you here today. We're incredibly privileged to host this large and important international gathering of sociologists at this significant moment in history. There is so much around us right now, politically, environmentally, with respect to settler relationships with indigenous peoples, and on issues of gender, migration, power, and violence that require our concerted and immediate attention. We have a major opportunity before us to share, consult, construct plans of actions so that uh, through our research, theorizing, social action, and mobilizing, we can help make a difference at this moment, important juncture in our collective history. The world needs sociology and sociologists to think hard, work hard, and work together to help make things better, because there's a lot right now that is not right. For example, just over one month ago, this province, Ontario, the province in which I live, elected a populist reactionary a, a mini Trump, uh, who many predict will take us down a very similar path to what America is going through today. Our mini Trump's first order of business on June 19th was to freeze hiring of civil servants on day one so that he can begin to look for efficiencies. The second order of business was to scrap provincial environmental commitments and agreements. And not far down his list, along with promised cuts to social spending, is the revamping of sexual education in our provincial education system, which comes with a nod to his friends and supporters in the pro-life movement. The problem is not that he has a conservative agenda. Conservative parties have conservative agendas. The problem is his willingness to just about, uh, do just about anything to get and keep approval from his supporters on the far right. It is this predictable unpredictability that concerns many of us most. While I'm deeply troubled by Doug Ford, our mini Trump, I'm even more concerned about the local, national, and international wave of support for the Fords and the Trumps of this world. It is our role and our duty as sociologists to act and do rigorous research and to mobilize peoples and knowledges for social justice and for change. Let us use the next six days to think deeply, speak openly and constructively, and to network and connect with old friends and new so that we can walk away refreshed, recharged, and ready for action, because action is what is needed right now. And before... Thank you.
And before we begin our important work together here, I wish to take a moment to thank the ISA and especially Dr. Margaret Abraham, the ISA president, and Isabella Barlinska, uh, the executive secretary of the ISA, for their incredibly hard work through all this, as well as the ISA executive. It was a great pleasure to get to know you at the various planning meetings and events over the past six years. I wish to thank our friends at Confex and JPDL, the two conference organizing companies who worked closely with us for many, many months in the lead up to this event. And I'd like to thank our many sponsors uh, who you will see hopefully in the expo um, and, and throughout the venue. I want to give a special thanks to the CSA executive and all the members of the LOC for their insight, contributions and support. Thank you to our incredibly hardworking team of coordinators, Margaret, Kenzie, Brittany, and Jasmine, and the over 150 volunteers who you will see around the convention center this week who gave up their time to help us have a positive and meaningful experience. But I especially wish to thank Sherry Fox, the executive administrator of the CSA, who was there every step of every way, every single day, for every task that crossed our emails and, and desks. So thank you, Sherry. The planning, the planning for this World Congress has been a long journey that has involved a lot of work for many people at the ISA, at the CSA, for the LOC, at Confex and JPDL, and we hope that what we've tried to do here for and with you allows you to have a productive and stimulating set of formal and informal exchanges that will hopefully meaningfully contribute to pro the, our profound need for the change that lies before us. So I'd like to close with, uh, uh, um, with a welcome. I would like to welcome you to Toronto, to Turtle Island, to the ISA World Congress. Thank you for coming, and we hope that you have an intellectually stimulating, and as Maggie mentioned, a fun stay here at the World Congress. Thank you. A few months ago, I was asked to welcome you here on behalf of the Canadian Sociological Association. So I started looking around for inspiration. I began thinking about models I could use for this kind of speech. Maybe I should look to the politicians. We've all seen the speeches that politicians give at openings to mega events. This conference certainly is one of them. It has over 5,000 delegates. We might say that this conference is the mega event of the sociological world. Maybe that would work. I could do what the politicians do and welcome you by talking about my country. I could tell you that here in Canada, we are very nice. I could also tell you that we are very multicultural, very peaceful, and very polite. But that would be a bit predictable. And it's not always as accurate as we might like it to be. So then I thought about the actors and the speeches they give at the Oscars. Those speeches can be powerful. But that wasn't going to work either. I don't own a ball gown. I would have to act surprised, and I would have to start thanking people, my agent, my producers, and my co-stars. So then I thought about the educational leaders and the speeches they give at graduation. Those speeches are inspirational, but that wasn't going to work either. Those speeches are way too peppy. Why did none of these approaches seem right? And then I remembered. I remembered that you're an audience of critical sociologists. You didn't come all this way just to hear banal national platitudes about Canada. You didn't come all this way just to hear me thank a bunch of people you've never met. And you certainly didn't come all this way just to hear me tell you how great you are. You came here to hear and you came here to deliver 
critical content on power, violence, and justice. So I thought about this theme and how it might relate to this opening ceremony. At first pass, we might be quite self-congratulatory. If we look at who is here, then this opening ceremony is quite historic, at least for a sociology conference. We are working to undo some of the power inequities that sociologists care about. The underrepresentation of women, of racialized people of color, and of indigenous peoples. This room is filled with people from around the world. But there's a counter question we might also ask. Instead of asking who is here, we might also ask who is not here. Not here are all the scholars, many from the global south, who could not be here because they could not afford to come to Canada. Also not here are scholars who were prevented by Canadian government officials from getting a Canadian entry visa. Also not here are some Indigenous peoples on whose land this conference is taking place. What should we think about the fact that as an Indigenous person, you still have to pay ISA $150, which is the cost of one day's attendance at this conference, in order to attend this opening ceremony on your own land? These are just a few small examples. I'm proud to be a Canadian sociologist, but these examples show how much work there is to do in Canada and around the world. These examples show that we will have to look inwards if we are to come up with the solutions needed in order to enact justice. What I also know is that these solutions will ultimately come from the work everyone here is doing. I know that this work will be instrumental in moving us towards more equitable societies. And with that said, I would like to wish you a big welcome from the Canadian Sociological Association. Thank you. Thank you for those welcomes, Margaret, Patricia, and Rima. I know I was already excited to be here, but now I'm even more excited for the week to begin because I think we have a lot of work to do in a week and beyond to exchange knowledges, to attend sessions, and gain more information. So I think I'm, I really feel like the welcome addresses have made us a bit more pumped to get there. To keep us on that momentum, I now would like to introduce Howard Ramos, the past president of the Canadian Sociological Association, who will deliver the message to the world from the Canadian Sociological Association. Il semble que le monde est entré dans les temps non sociologiques. El mundo parece haber entrado en tiempos non sociológicos. It would appear that the world has entered in non-sociological times. Looking around, we see a rise of uh, global nativism, xenophobia, and post-truth. We see fake news, and we see stories that blame individuals for larger social problems. We see these trends exacerbated by leaders such as Duterte in the Philippines, Erdogan in Turkey, uh, Orban in Hungary, or Trump in the States. It feels like simplistic, primordial, and individualistic assessments of the world and social problems are thriving. Such sentiment is affecting the cultural and environment uh, social world that we're living, which everyday people and sociologists live and work. It may even seem that the sociological imagination is out of sync with our global times. For these reasons, in these tumultuous times, it is important to hold a sociology conference on issues of power, violence, and justice. This being said, holding the conference in Canada, many people look at Canada and see it as an exception to the world's broader trends. People look to Canada, for instance, and see that Canada sees immigration 
as a solution to its problems, whereas the rest of the world sees immigration as a problem. In this city, Toronto, we see how the city has thrived as a result of newcomers and multiculturalism. It's a hub of innovation and creativity. Canada, however, is not immune to sociological trends, not immune to non-sociological trends, sorry. We have walked a similar path and skirt returning to that path today. The country's former Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, for instance, was fond of saying that it's not time to commit sociology. He was fond of saying it is not time to commit sociology. When he was asked about uh, terrorism, uh, violence against Indigenous uh, women and girls, or other social problems, that was his answer. He used it as a quasi-epithet in the same way that others have in recent years. Par exemple, nous pouvons regarder la parole de l'ancien premier ministre de France qui a accusé la sociologie d'être une un culture d'excuses. También podemos ver ejemplos más extremos de sociólogos que han sido amenazados o que han perdido la vida por el trabajo que hacen y la crítica que ofrecen. Mais en même temps, nous pouvons nous tourner vers le Canada, la sociologie canadienne et l'Association canadienne de sociologie pour une route sur la façon de faire, de faire la sociologie dans ce qui semble être des temps non sociologiques. When times appear to be non-sociological, Canadian sociologists put down that sentiment. They, they, they didn't accept it. When they heard committing sociology, they said, let's commit sociology. They took it as a call to action. They took it as a call to action to do and commit sociology, not retreat from it. And in doing so, sociologists contributed to ensuring that the pursuit of social justice was not lost. Rather, Canadian sociologists embraced and continue to embrace the need to pursue public sociology, to do innovative research, and to translate their insights into broader public and policy concentrations. Canadian sociologists also support a new generation one that sees past old barriers, that sees past old gender binaries, and who advocate for black lives, for refugees, and for indigenous reconciliation. Instead of retreating uh, in non-sociological times, the Canadian Association of Sociology grew to over 1,000 members as of last year. Sociologists also have joined international organizations such as this one, the ISA, with hundreds of Canadians participating in this conference and many leading ISA research clusters or sitting on the organization's executive. À cette époque, les sociologues canadiens et canadiennes ont également adopté des multiples méthodes de recherche, se sont tournés vers des théories à l'intérieur et à l'extérieur du discipline. Ils travaillent dans plusieurs langues et espaces pour agir pour une politique fondée sur des preuves et les données et la justice sociale. Our association's journal, the Canadian Review of Sociology, during non-sociological times did not back away from asking tough questions. It did not back away from questioning the manifest and the simple. Rather, through it, sociologists looked to how we could engage inequities, engage racialization, colonization, sexual discrimination, and at the same time offered evidence-based critique. In these meetings, I invite you to take a closer look at what Canadian sociologists are doing by coming to our four Canadian-themed plenaries that are occurring Monday through Thursday at 2 p.m. You will see that Canadian sociologists are engaging with issues related to refugee children and youth, and they work with colleagues from around the world to get better insights on how to settle newcomers. You will see that Canadian sociologists are reflecting on how to practice sociology in uncertain times and are looking at the past to see how we can navigate the future. You will see that Canadian sociologists are assessing the role of state and social movements by considering how those relations affect the organizing of women, environmental advocacy, and the pursuit of Indigenous rights. You will also see that Canadian sociologists are probing what role the discipline can play in reconciliation and the open scar of the country's missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. En même temps, Que ce soit le moment pour vous d'apprendre des idées de la sociologie canadienne, c'est aussi une occasion sans précédent pour les sociologues canadiens et canadiennes et l'Association canadienne de sociologie d'apprendre du monde, d'apprendre de vous. 
C'est un moment pour être avec des amis et des collègues que nous voyons trop rarement. C'est un moment pour créer des nouveaux amis et collègues. Est-ce à travers de la réunion avec nos collègues, amigos et amigas, comme aussi la création de nouvelles amistades et collaborations que nous assurons de que l'imagination sociologique ne se perde de vista en ce moment tumultuous. It is through meeting with our friends, our colleagues, and making some new ones that we ensure that sociology is not lost in this tumultuous moment. It is through doing so that we can embody the sociology that contemporary society so much needs. It's by doing so that we can ensure that we live in sociological times. It is my hope that by the end of these meetings that you will rise to the occasion, even you in the back over there, that you will rise to the occasion to commit some sociology with us. It is my hope that you get a chance to explore Dish with One Spoon territory, what is now Toronto, and get to see firsthand the diversity of this city. I hope that you have a wonderful conference. Miigwech, Nyawan, Wachie, Ulelen, Gracias, Merci, thank you. Thank you, Howard, for that call to commit more sociology. I'm sure there's many people in this room that have um, already thought of ways to respond to that call and have been responding to that call for some time, so it's great to have that renewed. I would like to now invite Margaret Abraham to present the uh, International Sociological Association Award for um, Excellence in Research and Practice. It is my great pleasure to announce the second ISA Award for Excellence in Research and Practice. Established in 2013, this award is given to a sociologist who advances and promotes sociological knowledge and practice through their contributions to the discipline, the profession, and to ISA. The announcement for this award was widely circulated. For a large number of excellent, from a large number of excellent candidates, all with impressive records, the members of the award committee selected Professor Nira Yuval Davis to be the recipient of the second ISA award. to be the recipient of the second ISA Award for Excellence in Research and Practice. I wanted it documented. <laughs> Professor Nira Yuval Davis is a stellar scholar who has made outstanding contributions to the discipline of sociology. Her contributions as a scholar, feminist, public intellectual, teacher, activist, and as an active member of the ISA, exemplify the spirit of this award. With work spanning over four decades, her work has made a global impact. Professor Nira Yuval Davis's interests are always topical and relevant, including gender studies, race, ethnicity, nation, and citizenship. Her research is influential theoretically and empirically innovative and cutting edge in quality. Nira's scholarly merits are well documented by an extensive publication list, and many of her works have been translated and published into several languages. Her work has highlighted the intersections between nation, race, citizenship, identity, belonging, and fundamentalism, to name a few. Her research has influenced the writings of many scholars and activists as she produces scholarship that, is con that consciously runs counter to the mainstream dominant discourses. She has repositioned how gender, ethnic, national, and class divisions are fought and discussed around the globe. Her books include Woman, Nation, State, Racialized Boundaries, Unsettling, Settling, uh, Unsettling Settler Nations, Gender and Nation, 
warning signs of fundamentalisms, the politics of belonging, intersectional contestations, and bordering. In addition to her impressive scholarship, Dr. Yuval Davis has also been a passionate activist and practitioner, working with dedication for the cause of women's rights and human rights. A true public intellectual, she's engaged in national, international, academic, and local levels in activist communities and social organizations. She was founding member of Women Against Fundamentalism and the International Research Network of Women in Militarized Conflict Zones, and has been the director of the Research Center on Migration, Refugees, and Belonging at the University of East London. She has consulted with NGOs and human rights organizations. Professor Neera Yuval Davis has been active for many years in the ISA, contributing as the president of RC05, Research Committee on Racism, Nationalism, Indig Indigeneity, and Ethnicity. She has organized conferences and co-organized international workshops on feminism, migration, refugees, belonging, all receiving high praise. I now invite Professor Neera Yuval Davis to come and receive the second ISA Award for Excellence in Research and Practice. Neera. taller than Maggie, but not much. <laughs> thank you very much, Maggie, and thank you for the ISA to select me for this distinguished award. I feel both very moved and very humbled by being selected to this prize, and I feel the need to share it with all the many people, colleagues, and friends with whom I've worked throughout the years. Moreover, I very much acknowledge that any theoretical breakthrough or paradigm shifts are based on uh, tipping points of a long cumulative body of thoughts and reflections. I also want to use, in spite of what said before, this opportunity to do thank my uh, family and friends who are been giving me unflinching support throughout all the trial and tribulations throughout the years. I've been a sociologist for many years, and I love sociology, whose aim, as my first sociology teacher, Professor Schmuel Eisenstadt, have told us, to turn assumptions into questions in whatever field of social life that interests us. Indeed, I've come to reject most of what you've told me during the years, but not this foundational approach. I particularly like the kind of sociology that has been promoted in recent years by the ISA, especially the last two presidents, but we heard it all in all the amazing speeches that preceded me today. This is a non-Eurocentric, non-positivist, -positiv intersectional, and uh, sociology that is not satisfied just by deconstructing and analyze society, but wants to contribute to a better and more just society. It is a non-essentialist sociology, which goes beyond fixed identities and social locations. Growing up in Israel, I know more than many how quickly victims can turn into victimizers and racialized people can turn racist themselves. Therefore, I think we need to have an approach to sociological research which take into consideration incorporate and encompass the situated gazes, the differential situated gazes 
of people from so different social positioning, different identifications, and normative value system. However, and the title of this conference is reflecting it, we must see it all, analyze it all, within the context of power, violence, and justice in order to be able to approach a valid uh, if a picture of what we try to analyze. So it's a normative sociology which is global and decentered. And if I've done and if I've made even a small contribution to such a sociology, especially in terms of helping the counter movements to the very dark times and days in which we are living today, of which we have heard a bit before and we'll he hear much more during the conference, then I'm satisfied. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Nira, on your achievement. It sounds like it was much more than a small contribution. <laughs> the next set of awards are for ISA's worldwide competition for junior sociologists, and I would like to introduce Elena Drava-Maslova, the coordinator for this competition, who will be presenting these awards. Good evening, everybody. I'm very happy to be here, and I expect you to be happy too, <laughs> in a minute, because now you will see in, personal, in persons the future of sociology. I'm talking about this wonderful worldwide competition of junior sociologists which we have in ISA, and this time it was the seventh competition. And we had 70 papers from 24 countries. And there were several rounds of expertise and selection in our committee. Uh, the criteria was, of, of course, professional level, critical standpoint, methodological clarity, sociological imagination. It was difficult to choose, and we had 11 finalists and five winners. Grand jury headed by the president, Margaret Abraham, uh, selected these five winning papers. Uh, the winners and finalists uh, were invited uh, to the workshop pre-conference workshop organized by Patricia. This was a wonderful event. The presentations were even better than the papers. And the people were communicating. They are our community. They are here on the second row. And I invite four winners, one after another, to come and get the certificates which are saying that their papers are the best. The first is Bushta Ziani, University Zidi Mohammed Ben Abdillah from Morocco. <laughs> His paper was about youth and sexuality in Moroccan society, sexual revolution, in Morocco and its future. Thank you, Bouta. Uh, the second winning paper is Martin Portos Garcia, Scuola Normale Superiore Italy. It was on social movements, it is on social movements, unpacking the virtuous circle, a grieved protest, eventful protest of both at the same time, it is about Spain and the very recent strikes and cycle of protest. Come. 
Our third winner is uh, Yuan Zheng Li, University Laval, Canada. She wrote about environment, environmental innovation in Japan in Chinese firms. Apologies. Joined the eco innovation bandwagon evidences from Chinese firms. She made participant observations there. It was difficult. Tommaso Gravante, Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico. Mexico. Uh, uh, well, it is written in Spanish, but it is the construction de una nueva narrativa social a partir del movement Altsinapa. I don't know Spanish. So it was <laughs> about, but uh, I mean, he wrote in Spanish. But presentation was in English, and we have language jury that was selecting the papers that could be submitted in many languages. Actually, we had uh, papers in eight languages. Yes, yeah, so we had even in Arabic and Spanish. So, Tamaza, are you here? I'm sorry to pronounce in the wrong way the title of your speech, and but it was of your of your paper. It was on social movements in Mexico. Thank you. Thank you. He's doing sociology of emotions. Okay, this is our future. And uh, I mean, you can see how beautiful, inspiring, uh, and I mean, they are, and the papers are also very good. <laughs> I'm sorry, thank you, Martin. Okay, you sure? And we go. Please don't worry, Elena. Sometimes when I'm up here, I don't even know if I know English. So how exciting is it to see the next generation of scholars so wonderfully represented by these award winners? I think there's nothing more exciting than seeing the, the next generation, and, I, and they represent a, a multitude of individuals that are out there, and I'm just coming up behind us to do a lot of committing sociology, we're, we're hoping. I am now happy to introduce Emilio Santos from the Brazilian Sociological Association, who is chair of the local organizing committee for the 2020 ISA Forum of Sociology to be held in Porto Alegro. It's never too early to start planning, and Hermelia will tell us why we need to. Good evening. Dear Magrahat, Magrahat Abraham, dear colleagues, on behalf of my university, PUC, and the Brazilian Sociological Association, SPS, it is an honor to invite you to the fourth ISA Forum of Sociology to be held in Porto Alegre, Brazil, in July 2020, only two years before we celebrate two centuries of our independence. Porto Alegre is located in the south of Brazil and has become an example of participatory democracy. Since 1989, citizens can decide on part of the citizens of the uh, city's public budget. Porto Alegre became international known for hosting the first edition of the World Social Forum in 2001, and three other editions of this international event that also took place at the campus of our university. In all these opportunities, Porto Alegre demonstrated its aptitude to welcome people from different cultures, ideologies, and beliefs. Those interested in visiting other beautiful and exciting places in Brazil after the ISA Forum can easily f fly from Porto Alegre to Rio de Janeiro Sao Paulo, Brasilia, Iguaçu Falls, Salvador Bahia, or even to the Amazon forest. Our campus offers a very pleasant, clean, and green landscape in which the forum participants can easily move around to attend the session, sessions, have lunch, or to use bank facilities. In your, in your bag, 
there are some practical details on your trip to Porto Alegre. In the exhibition hall, you will find our stand where you can take a small gift from us and deposit your coupon to compete for four free hotel nights during the fourth ISA Forum in Porto Alegre and extra discounts in hotels. You are welcome. <laughs> I would like to use the remaining time of my presentation to show you a short video with an overview of Porto Alegre and the venues in which we will meet for sure in 2020. Thank you very much for your attention. Have a very productive Congress and enjoy Toronto. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emilio. It's now in my planner, and I'm sure it is in many others. If that wasn't enough to get your sociological imagination packing your suitcases, it is now my pleasure to introduce the representatives from the Australian Sociological Association to give a bit of a teaser about the 20th ISA World Congress of Sociology slated for Melbourne in 2022. Please welcome Dan Woodman, President and Convener of the Local Organizing Committee, who is joined by his two co-conveners, Katie Hughes and Joe Lindsay, both past presidents of their association. Uh, hello all, uh, I'm Dan Woodman, so I'm the current president of the Australian Sociological Association. And how exciting is it to hear we're going to Brazil? Wow. Um, I'm, I know I, I speak for myself, but I'm sure for almost everybody here, if not everyone, that it's very exciting to be here in Toronto with uh, Professor Abraham and the ISA executive, Professor Albanese and the Canadian Local Organising Committee and, and all our colleagues to commit sociology for, for a week in Canada. Uh, but I'm, I'm even more excited to know that the next two major ISA events are going back to the Southern Hemisphere. 
Um, so on that note, I just want to say on behalf of Taza, we look forward to welcoming you to, to Melbourne, Australia for the 20th uh, World Congress of Sociology in 2022. So our, our time is pretty short, so I'm going to hand straight over to, to my colleague Katie Hughes, who will uh, show you a short video. That's the thing to do, it seems, in these uh, presentations about Melbourne and Australia before Joe Lindsay uh, tells you a little bit about how you can find out some more. Thank you. Um, Australia is a, a unique country and it's a huge country. It's also a cosmopolitan country and it's home to the um, longest continuing cultures in, in the world. Melbourne uh, is the capital of Victoria, which is in the very uh, se the second smallest state in the southeast corner of Australia. Melbourne's been awarded the world's most livable city uh, status for seven years in a row now. And that's in terms of its quality of life, its safety, uh, its health care, and its educational institutions. So now let's have a quick look at what you'll be enjoying when you join us in Melbourne in, in 2022. Hello, I'm uh, Jo Lindsay and we would be delighted if you could join us in Melbourne, Australia for the 2022 ISA World Congress. You can find out more about coming to Australia by visiting our booth in the um, Expo Hall, booth number 30, and by talking to any of our TASA members um, during the conference. Australian sociologists have a cosmopolitan outlook engaging with scholarship from our Asia-Pacific region and around the globe. And you'll find Australian colleagues are engaged in all of the research committees here at the Congress. And many will be wearing a badge with the information that's on the, uh, the slide there um, to identify themselves, so don't be shy to say hello. Melbourne's a wonderful uh, multicultural and an intellectual city, and I encourage you to start planning your trip here as well. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Dan, Katie, and Joe. I spent some time in Australia, and I, I, it is a beautiful country, and I actually call myself a Kanazi now, <laughs> not a Canadian. I'm sure I'm not the first person to have coined that term. Thank you very much for the introduction to what is sure to be an amazing event that you have lots of time to prepare for, but I'm sure as the Canadian Local Organizing Committee would attest to that, that time passes very quickly, because here we are, indeed. Now I have the pleasure of inviting back to the stage a familiar face, and as many of you know, integral to the ISA during her tenure as president, as well as to the evolution of the theme for this Congress, Margaret Abraham, who will deliver her address, Power of Violence and Justice, Reflections, Responses and Responsibilities. Before I do anything, uh, let me first say we should give a big round of applause to the local organizing committee. <laughs> Patricia Albanese, can you just stand for a second? Before I begin my address, I would like us to have a moment of silence to remember all the sociologists who have passed away in the four years since our last Congress. Thank you. As you can imagine, I'm grateful to my family, friends, and colleagues, but it would be impossible to name them all here today, and after what Rima said, even harder. <laughs> However, I do want to take this opportunity to acknowledge my parents, especially my mom, Mary Abraham, who is my inspiration. Then, there are these two very special people in the audience whom I would like to publicly acknowledge my life partner and soulmate, Pradeep Singh, who has been an important and integral part of my life journey. And, <laughs> and our son, Arun Abraham Singh, who along with his generation, continue to give me hope for the future. Thank you. The theme of our 19th ISA World Congress of Sociology revolves around the multiple forms of intersection that can arise between power, violence, and the implications this has for justice. We are at a critical juncture in our human journey where the policies and actions of a powerful few have engendered inequality, conflict, harm, injustice, and suffering on a stunning scale around the world. We sociologists need to step up now with purpose and draw upon our theories, research, and practice in the best interests of humanity. The ISA has brought together the knowledge, talent, and resources of sociologists from across the world to address the gamut of issues relating to these dynamics. The Congress theme is a subject so immeasurably vast, complex, and multifaceted that it will be probably discussed and debated in all of the 1,200 sessions that have been organized. For my part, I shall share a few pertinent issues that I consider relevant and of critical importance to some of our deliberations over the next few days. Hopefully, our sociological inquiries, reflections, and responses will help build a better understanding of the problems that beset our societies and contribute to framing policies and actions that will make for a less violent, more just, and enduring world. Power 
defined as a capacity to influence or control the behavior and conduct of others has largely determined the historical trajectory that leads us to where we stand today. Power is a critical component in all human interactions. It can be creative and it can be destructive. As a character in George Orwell's 1984 says, we know that no one seizes power with the intention of relinquishing it. Power is not a means, it is an end. The object of power is power. In our world today, this is too often the case. History tells us many stories of contestations for power in the multiple areas of human interaction. It tells us of its uses and also of its corruption. In the context of nation states, we have seen the use of power that is coercive and uses military might or economic advantage to force and manipulate compliance. We have seen power through intimidation and persuasion on display on the world stage. We have witnessed how coercive power and violence go hand in hand, as force is consistently and uh, consistently the preferred instrument of the powerful against the weak or vulnerable. One can find this in the interventions in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan, Russia's annexation of Crimea, the next nuclear deal, the travel bans from certain Muslim majority nations, and the imprisonment of immigrants in Texas as just recent examples. History has shown us that such exercises of power and control sow the seeds for future conflict. Violence in all of its various forms threatens social cohesion, even at the level of microaggressions and invisible biases. Decrying violence as being an unmitigated evil, however, is also problematic. Mahatma Gandhi, a proponent of nonviolence, understood this dilemma when he observed, though violence is not lawful when it is offered in self-defense or for the defense of the defenseless, it is an act of bravery far better than cowardly submission. His reference point was colonialism, arguably the most formidable exposition of power in the last two centuries. It was a system that we now recognize as being, as being a persistent narrative of genocide, violence, suffering, and injustice. Similarly, Franz Fanon viewed violence in this context as being a necessary tool for the emancipation of the oppressed. The context, connections, and intersections that inform our understanding of power, violence, and justice matter. Weber described the state as having the monopoly on the legitimate use of violence or force as a means of maintaining social order and cohesion. Bestowing such power to the state, however, has been challenged by aggrieved agencies within and outside the system, primarily on the grounds that the established order has been unjust to certain groups, and especially to those already disempowered. Imbued with such power, states have taken advantage of this monopoly to oppress and repress certain groups who then have no substantive recourse to justice. The discordance in interests and views of the state in relation to such groups has been a trigger for violence irrespective of the form of the state apparatus in place. As Martin Luther King po pointed out, there can be no peace without justice. A particularly worrying feature of the present times is the violence being used against vulnerable sections of the population who have been identified by the state in one way or another as being the other. 
This now becomes the relentless tool of politicians and certain media, a form of targeting and controlling difficult or marginalized groups in many countries, often through some form of state collusion. The plight of the Rohingyas in Myanmar, ethnic Tamils in Sri Lanka, Muslims in India, Christian Copts in Egypt, Kurds in Iraq and Syria, Kurds and Armenians in Turkey, and immigrants and people of color in Europe and America are only a few examples. We live in an age of cataclysmic social change, economic misgivings, and global tensions. The traditional bastions of liberal democracy have become pillars of uncertainty about the shape of things to come. The liberal smugness implicit in theories like Francis Fukuyama's End of History or Tony Blair's observation that the grand ideological battles of the 20th century are over now sound particularly hollow and naive as was their optimism about the permanence of liberal democracy. What we're witnessing today is a counter movement that is interrogating the structures and institutions celeb celebrated as a bequest of Western liberal democracy and capitalism to the world. This is a movement that is deeply distrustful of the most basic liberal values of tolerance, inclusion, and even human rights. It is challenging us to look at how these principles have been used to enable complacency and complicity in various forms of systemic exclusion and injustice. There is widespread frustration and anger at the mounting inequality and economic uncertainty that have created great cleavages within society at the fragmentation and uprooting of lives caused by marketization and globalization and that the vast numbers of migrants who have been displaced as a result of endless conflict and persecution. Some of these frustrations have led to activism, some to despair, and some have morphed into a shrill nationalism that is populist, xenophobic, ethnocentric, and hostile to minorities and immigrants. In 2014, Viktor Orban, Minister of Hungary, Prime Minister of Hungary, captured the world's attention with what is known as his illiberal democracy speech. To quote him, there is a race underway to find the method of community organization, the state, which is most capable of making a nation and a community internationally com competitive. The most popular topic in thinking today is trying to understand how systems that are not Western, not liberal, not liberal democracies, and perhaps not even democracies, can nevertheless make their nations successful. Orban implies that behind the veneer of democracy, a nation state can be a winner by rejecting liberal values and democratic norms where only the end goal matters and not the methods deployed. Orban has given voice to a worldview that seems to be shared by an increasing number of populist leaders across the world. A recent issue of Time magazine had a cover story titled, The Rise of the Strongman. It describes the emergence of powerful populist leaders in countries across the world who care little for civil liberties and the rule of law. What can be more devastating to democracy than the tragic unraveling of the hopes engendered by the Arab Spring? Egypt, which was at the heart of the democratic upheavals of 2011, is now in the thrall of a dictator, Abdel Fateh el-Sisi. It is significant that a number of countries, governments are encouraging and fostering schisms within society by playing on the fears and insecurities of ordinary citizens and targeting ethnic, religious, racial minorities, migrants and dissidents, effectively constructing the other to use as a target for discrimination, violence and repression. 
The reality of economic and social setbacks have created a sense of loss and instilled fear. For many groups in society, there is a pervasive sense that we are facing a bleak future. Society's fear, frustration, dis disenchantment, and rage have all been manipulated and twisted by politicians for their own interests and power. What matters is not the truth, but the ab ability to appeal to people's emotions, to align statements to correspond with, or even to develop anxieties. The fear generated by the 2008 financial crisis devastated multiple economies with consequences particularly for the common person and civil societies. There was, this was further exacerbated by the arrival of immigrants who have been displaced due to persecution, ongoing wars and conflicts from countries such as Syria, Afghanistan, South Sudan, Somalia, and Myanmar. Terrorist attacks linked to Islamic fundamentalism then added to the fears and resentments that were growing against immigrants and outsiders, all of which were, has resulted in a turn towards nationalist, xenophobic, far-right, populist political positioning. Those who took up these positions in both the media and governance appealed to people's emotionality and perceived grievances to their sense of insecurity and loss. The populist rhetoric resonated. Those who hold more liberal views have watched with dismay as populist leaders manipulate public sentiment in the direction of racism and hyper-nationalism. However, there is also a growing response to counter the promotion of anti-plurality and the erosion of democratic institutions. Proponents of social justice and social activism push against this tide of hate, and every day they are gaining ground for greater humanity, acceptance, inclusion, and understanding. Ironically, sections of the underprivileged, many of whom should be practical allies of liberal social policies, are now increasingly supporting right-wing and xenophobic forces we may not be seeing the actual end of liberal de democracy, but the dangers facing it are palpable. Across the world, authoritarian and autocratic populists have been gaining ground, consolidating and centralizing power and control. We are seeing the resurgence of the authoritarian personality and the popular belief in the strong state. Most recently, we saw this in Turkey, with President Erdogan's victory through democratic elections, which have allowed him to cons continue to consolidate his power and extend his authority over the legislature and judiciary. Indeed, we are seeing this story play out multiple times all over the world. A deeply dis disturbing feature of our time is the majoritarian impulse gaining momentum even in acclaimed democracies like the US and India. In both of these countries, leaders with an unmistakable majoritarian agenda have come to power democratically through the will of the people. These leaders have then undermined their country's hard-won freedoms and have eroded democratic institutions and values. They have sought to buttress power by dividing their people and targeting those with whom they see as either threat or as an opportunity to victimize for political interests and gain. The problem with the majoritarian worldview is that it invariably excludes certain groups of civil society. For example, on the basis of race, ethnicity, religion, class, and gender identity. Such exclusions, in turn, give rise to deeply polarized societies, which then perpetuate these tendencies. At its core, 
Social justice is premised on the principle that every human being matters, that every person has a right to equality and fundamental liberties, to security and dignity. This is the essence of an egalitarian society. Although, in reality, equality has never been totally achieved. Today, this basic postulate of democracy is under serious threat from a growing band of authoritarian and ethically compromised leaders and those who enable them. On his campaign trail for the US presidency, Donald Trump violated the norms of civility and decency, indulged in blatant falsehoods and false equivalences, incited hatred, violence, and distrust of minorities, including blacks, Latinos, Muslims, and immigrants. He exhibited misogyny and sexism, boasted on tape about sexual assault, and yet he won the electoral college votes to gain the US presidency. His victory is attributed on the one hand to his pandering to the prejudice of white nationalists and on the other to a deep suspicion and dissatisfaction with the liberal elite and the existing establishment. The fears and realities of lost jobs and absent opportunities have all fed into this burgeoning xenophobia in America. The power of populist rhetoric to resonate with the fears and frustrations in a period of both perceived and real uncertainty should be of great concern to us. The power of the presidency has now eroded key institutions in America, and it has in no way restrained Trump and his administration from initiating and even executing extremely regressive and harmful policies. Limiting funds, funding for women's reproductive health, providing massive tax breaks for the rich, preventing victims of domestic violence and gang violence from seeking asylum in the United States, and most recent and outrageous, the shocking, inhuman cruelty of separating illegal migrant parents from their children at the border. Here is an example of power being used to inflict such careless suffering and misery on the vulnerable. We know from colonial histories in the United States, Canada, and Australia of the role the state played in rationalizing and enacting the forced separation of indigenous parents from their children. We also know the horrific consequences of this and the long road through the process of truth and reconciliation. We're also witnessing the power that public pressure can have in fighting against such violence by challenging unjust laws policies and practices, and especially highlighting those that devastate the lives of children, families, and communities. Donald Trump has been admiring and wistful in expressing his views about North Korea's dictator, Kim Jong-un. He has publicly expressed appreciation for other dictators across the world, such as Vladimir Putin, Abdel Fateh el-Sisi, Rodrigo Duterte, Trump's, Trump's public assertions that he has the power to pardon himself, meaning that he considers himself to be above the law, have triggered the talk of an imperial presidency. His endless attacks on the liberal media and creation of fake news have also contributed to de deep and dangerous divides. The first half of the 2018 saw his approval ratings rise. And this is an important indication of the state of civil society. It is one that we need to contemplate and to engage with skillfully. All of this and more has been going on. And there has been not much mention of what's been playing out in India in the past four years. India today 
the world's largest democracy, is a striking example of an illiberal democracy with a dangerous blend of power, violence, and, justice, and injustice. The muted response of the metropolitan states to the creeping fascism and blatant human rights violations occurring in India can be primarily linked to commerce. India is the largest importer of armaments in the world. It is also a huge market for a variety of imports from the developed countries. These countries that dominate and define the international discourse on freedom and human rights are strategically silent when it comes to policies or practices in countries where they have significant economic interest. To those who dispute the capacity of political leaders to remold society in consonance with their worldview, the happenings in India in the last few years are an ominous example of the use of power and violence to undermine key democratic values. India has moved from plurality to a deeply polarized majoritarian state very quickly. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi came to power in 2014 with a massive win through a free and fair election. Modi captured the public imagination by promising a more decisive, powerful polity and an equitable social order. But within months of taking office, it became clear that he and his party planned to convert India into a homogenous supremacist Hindu state, the Hindu Rashtra of Hindutva, where Hindus could claim to be the privileged community of India and where minorities, including Muslims and Christians, would live as second-class citizens. There are many reports of lynching, gang rapes, vandalism, and acts of religious desecration, all with near impunity. A group of social activists who visited the sites of lynching and hate crimes across eight states of India were horrified to find that the police had lodged charges against the victims and their kin in these instances, whereas the actual perpetrators were treated leniently, their bail not opposed. What is most disturbing is that it's not just India and the United States but across the world that we are seeing the complicity of state institutions in the persecution of marginalized groups. Even our justice systems at times succumb to the majoritarian pressures that victimize and oppress. Even when justice systems do hold strong, the populist ten rhetoric tenaciously erodes the legitimacy of institutions and processes that ensure justice. One should not despair, however, for these atrocities and manipulations are stirring many who otherwise would have remained complacent. In 2018, it takes effort to keep one's head in the sand and re remain oblivious. There is a great energy mounting, rallying against these oppressions. Many people are coming together to build networks and connections to challenge all abuses of power, not just the most recent, but also those that have been present and systemic for a long time. Documenting harms, participating in protests, speaking at public rallies, working and reporting from conflict zones, providing facts and writing thought-provoking articles in the mainstream media are just some examples of what people are doing and what we can do. There are so many who work to highlight the ongoing violence and injustice, who critique and analyze the structures of power and seek social justice. Through active involvement in dissent and resistance, through research and action, Sociologists can and need to reflect on the positive impact of our that our perspectives can have in grappling with the problems of the world. There is a direct nexus between the rise of right-wing populist nationalism across the world and the international disregard 
for human rights violations. A significant aspect of such populism is its insular and divisive character. There is a shift from globalism to narrow narcissistic nationalism, a sense that only one's own nation matters. That's where the lines must be drawn. America first, Hungary first, the Brexit syndrome. As society gets polarized between the narrow framing of citizenry and the other, populist leaders play on the insecurities and fears of the people. They attribute all the blame for their perceived grievances on antagonistic forces who are variously defined as anti-nationalist, elitist, corrupt, or terrorist. The populist consistency is portrayed as the long-suffering victims of domestic or foreign enemies, and the majority are seen as being more equal than the few, which then perpetuates their fear of becoming marginalized. In such a mil social milieu that scapegoats vulnerable sections of the population, the values of inclusivity, tolerance, and respect lose their salience in both interpersonal and larger social interactions. As a consequence of this rise in populism, there is now an unwillingness on the part of the world's democracies to intervene, even in areas where there have been heinous human rights violations. The world watches today at the most, as the most horrendous atrocities occur in countries such as Syria, Yemen, South Sudan, Myanmar, and Venezuela, to name just a few. The exercise of economic and political power and the use of suffering as a tool for coercion and control are increasingly justified by the perpetrators of these atrocities. Violence through forced displacement, starvation, rape, burning, chemical attacks, and the spectrum of widespread injustices have not been met with an adequate global response. Perhaps facing precariousness at home nations no longer feel it is their responsibility to intervene to ensure the safety of those considered foreigners, particularly the vulnerable and the violated. The reluctance of the international community to e effectively intervene, even in the world's hotspots of genocidal conflict, has resulted in widespread human suffering and death. One example, of an unremitting assault on human rights is the ethnic cleansing offensive against Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar. Over the decades, the Rohingyas, an ethnic minority, have been the victims of endemic discrimination violence in a majority Buddhist nation. But in August 2017, following an attack by Rohingya insurgents using knives and crude homemade bombs in which 12 members of the security forces were killed, the full force of the state was mobilized in a targeted ethnic cleansing strategy. This resulted in thousands of deaths, rampant rape, and destruction of properties and the exodus of 700,000 Rohingya Muslims primarily to Bangladesh. While the scale of violence has since reduced, there seems little hope of the refugees returning to their homes. And as such, they join the 68.5 million displaced and dispossessed, dispossessed people around the world. The structural and relational aspects of power, violence, and injustice and the corresponding crises of displacement and dispossession are major areas for us sociologists to address. And we will be having many spotlight sessions and other sessions during this uh, conference. I hope you will attend some of them. Gender equality and justice are fundamental to democracies and indeed must be to all societies. They are necessary 
for national and global stability, well-being, prosperity, and progress. We need to continue to address the position of women and girls in society's complex power matrix. There are numerous interconnections between gender, violence, and the state. Feminists, activists, and scholars have underscored how gender inequalities intersect with other inequalities such as race, class, citizenship, immigrant or minority status, unequal access to resources, exclusion from participation in decision making, all of which tend to exacerbate violence against women. States are intimately connected to the structural violence that perpetuates these gendered oppressions. As an integral part of the power apparatus in society, through the expression and reproduction of gendered power relations, the state plays a key role in normalizing gender-based and intersectional violence, which then often becomes socially invisible. International forums like CEDAW and international tribunals have provided valuable insights on state complicity in violence against women. The systematic targeting of women for sexual violence is also characteristic of modern day warfare and conflict. Despite the laws and women's movements that have tried to criminalize violence against women, there has not been an adequate response made, made in ensuring women's security and safety. We all need to worry that the UN report of 2015 on the status of violence against women has pointed to its persistence at alarmingly high levels in the majority of countries. The persistence, pre prevalence, and pervasiveness of gender-based and intersectional violence requires continued attention. Time and again, women con continue to be denied control over their bodies and are excluded from decision-making. Millions of women experience violence at the hands of an intimate partner. Violence is used as a political tool and as part of the process of displacement. Violence and discrimination against LGBTQ have also been a part of the propaganda used by states and populist leaders. When those who trivialize, demean, and no normalize violence against women are elected to the highest offices, we need to examine and illuminate both the subtle and overt causes, contexts, and structures that support and recreate the objectification, harm, and disregard for the voices and experiences of all women and all people. We must do this if we are to have any hope of ending such violence. Although the term was first created by Th Tarana Burke in 1997, the recent attention gained through the Me Too movement has been celebrated as a social revolution with millions of like-minded women from more than 85 countries bombarding cyberspace with the hashtag Me Too, in solid uh, with the hashtag Me Too in solidarity for those who have suffered sexual assault and harassment. Although a critical watershed, this movement ga garnered international attention partly because of the high profile individuals involved. When the New York Times first broke the story, they were surprised that even celebrities who were powerful and perceived to have broken the glass ceiling were vulnerable to sexual assault and violence like any ordinary women. The movement offered a reflection of society's patriarchal structures, the forms of power and control, and its implications for the lives and life chances of survivors. It is a reminder of the formidable but important task that we must continue to take, that we must continue to take on to combat patriarchy, point out sexism, and seek justice. The transformations and contributions that women's movements have made to our lives, our institutions, and our understanding of the world 
have been substantial. They should not be underestimated. Increasingly, we can see there's an increase in awareness of gender inequalities around the world, as well as the corresponding struggles that have been taken up to rectify these issues. Various theoretical frameworks and academic perspectives have contributed to anti-violence and liberation movements in different parts of the world, and have advocated for more grassroots movements, inclusivity, and participatory activism and research. We have made a lot of progress in addressing gender issues, yet this progress is uneven. And there is still a long way to go as we see the persistence of gender inequality intersecting with other forms of discrimination. The growth of right-wing populism and attempts to set back some of the hard-won struggles for greater equality and the increased polarization of civil society requires a response. Women and social justice movements, I believe, are attempting to respond by drawing attention to intersecting identities, making women's rights as human rights and human rights as women's rights. This then has implications for gender justice and social justice for all. One of the ways that the women's movement's attempts to counter right-wing populism has been to challenge patriarchal structures and relations within societies. They challenge those structures of power and institutions that create and maintain other forms of inequality and oppression, which maintain and exacerbate oppression. On January 21st, 2017, under the auspices, auspices of the Women's March on Washington, millions of women took to the streets within the US and across the globe to protest Trump's election. It was also indicative of the need to confront the persistence and pre prevalence of patriarchal power and its intersections with other axes of oppression, such as race, ethnicity, class, religion, sexual identity, citizenship, and more. The Women's March on Washington mobilized and brought to the mainstream the notion of intersectionality to address issues of reproductive rights, gender and intersectional violence, migrant rights, labor rights, citizenship, racial justice, freedom of speech, right to science, environmental justice, and more. Let me touch on the power of the media. Globalization, technology, and social media have facilitated a more connected world but it is increasingly coming at the cost of truth. This has been called the post-truth era, and it is an extreme crisis that democracies are facing as the credibility of the media is both questionable and being challenged. No discussion of power, violence, and justice today would be complete without factoring in the enormous influence of the knowledge and information that is disseminated, distorted, or dismissed by the media. The insurgency of social media in particular, with its boundless capacities for good, bad, and trite, creates a world of reaction and gullibility, where drama and division play out in seconds, often with little regard to human cost or reality. Social media has become the major instrument of political and cultural power, and a psychological and emotional effect is beginning to be looked at and understood. Today, bigotry and falsehood can be manufactured and transmitted worldwide instantaneously. Today, social media has, to some degree, replaced traditional forms of knowledge and information gathering. Social media has become the prime tool for dissemination of ideas, news, and opinions. Social media also carries the danger of misinformation, fake news, and fake equivalences. But it is also an opportunity to challenge and contest lies and to foster global connections and collaborations. The press has a particularly important role and responsibility to, re 
to report accurately and with rigor. The fourth estate is vital to reporting on issues of power, violence, and justice, thus preserving and strengthening the pillars of democracy. There are social scientists and political thinkers who believe that the hope of the future lies in civil society. And so let me touch briefly on protest movements. The difficulty is then the deep divides that polarize us all when we think about civil society. In fact, the greatest threat is the burgeoning power of majoritarianism that is sweeping through many countries using the momentum of polarization and fear. The mobilization of various fundamentalist majorities and against ethnic and religious minorities, migrants, the LGBT, LGBTQ and other communities is a new terrorism that affects societies around the globe. Protest movements have been an important part in addressing these issues. Globally, people are mobilizing and challenging oppressive social, political, and economic regimes. These are encouraging signs of a growing resistance to systems that have exacerbated inequality and injustice. Protest movements like those led by the indignados in Spain and Portugal, indigenous movements around the world, the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States, the farmers movement in India, the landless people's movement in South Africa, the Time's Up, Say Her Name and Me Too movements are all at the forefront of resistance against entrenched exploitative systems. They offer us real hope for the future. What is required, however, is to understand how such movements can translate into structural and systemic change for a better world. Sociology matters. Sociologists around the world have a long history of research related to the concepts and meanings embedded in power, violence, and justice. I firmly believe that we have congreg congregated here today to find ways of combating the growing inequality and injustice, the endless cycles of war and violence in our world. It is not only the atrocity of war and armed conflict that is the problem. It is also the violence that runs deep in our homes, neighborhoods, schools, and workplaces. We are increasingly becoming cognizant of how inundated our world is by violence around issues of gender, race, religion, class, and many others, for example. Even violence against the environment. The challenge for sociology then is to find meaning and make sense of these complex, ever-changing dynamics through a greater understanding of structures and relationships. In these troubled times, the ISA, as the Global Association of Sociologists, has an important role to play. Founded in 1949 against the backdrop of World War II, the ISA mandate was not just to serve purely intellectual and cultural functions, but rather it was for promoting democracy and for serving broad social purposes. Its aim has always been to both envisage and work toward a future in which organizations could grapple with the problems in our world and be proactive in pointing out new directions for progressive social change. It is in the same vein, vein, it is in the same vein toward the goal of increasing the public visibility, accessibility, and effectiveness of sociology and sociological knowledge globally that the ISA initiated the first comprehensive global mapping of sociologists for social inclusion. GMSSI. Officially released in February 2018, 
we hope GMSSI will serve as a resource to help identify, connect, and enable global collaborations, and particularly support sociologists who encounter barriers, either economic or political, which impede their participation in global exchanges. And we heard some of that today in the introduction. Sociology, together with other disciplines, can help contour a better place and understanding. But this means we must share our research with the main stakeholders, the public. At this critical time, we sociologists must share our research, reflect and respond to issues, provide clear frameworks for analysis, counter distortions and misinterpretations, and substantiate our perspectives on key concepts in terms that are accessible and straightforward. We must use our analysis to intervene and address injustices. Of course, I'm aware that this can be personally perilous with swift retribution for some. So many of us, however, have the advantage of, the free, of freedom of expression as scholars and public intellectuals. We therefore also have the responsibility to mobilize through research and action for greater good of society. We must make an impact and challenge conventional impulses around how things have been done because it is now that we need time for change. It is now time for change. For some of us, this will mean climbing down from the tower of academia and modifying our channels of communicating, clarifying our findings and insights in a manner that can be heard above the din and clamor. We will have to harness the power of those very tools that are currently being used to distort and misinform. We will have to go beyond the traditional sources of knowledge dissemination and communicate our sociological perspectives using a, a wide array of avenues and technologies. In the next few days, let our sociological endeavors forge pathways towards a better present and a hopeful future. We have an intellectual, moral, and social responsibility to generate and share knowledge and engage in collective action to build a better and more just world. Thank you, and thank you for your support during these past four years. Thank you and welcome, Emilia. Thank you, Margaret for that sobering, yet more importantly, very inspiring address. I think it gives us much food for thought as we proceed with a busy week and reminds us of the importance of not only being sociologists, but the responsibilities as well of being a sociologist. That concludes our ceremony for this evening. I would like to thank everyone who contributed to facilitating this event, especially the gentleman who kept putting the, the box here and then <laughs> taking it away. <laughs> I'd also like to thank everyone who participated and spoke throughout the evening, which laid a really solid foundation for the activities of the coming week and to remind us and to get our minds in the state that we want them to be in as we proceed with World Congress. More importantly, I want to thank all of you who attended um, and, and engaged with us in thoughts um, and hearing the words and bringing those further from this room. In appreciation, I want to move from one sort of fun to another type of fun um, that Margaret has mentioned that will not begin until nine, however, 
Um, so this will be a chance for you to get out, and I was going to suggest get some fresh air, but I'm not quite sure that's possible. <laughs> but maybe if you can move around and stretch your legs, and at 9 p.m. we'll be opening up the doors for the welcome reception, and we'd love to have you join us on level 300, which is two floors above in Exhibition Hall A. So please enjoy the rest of the week's activities, the knowledge exchanges, and of course the City of Toronto, which is on the territory of Dish With One Spoon, Wampum Territory Treaty. Thank you.